After six months of blaring the alarm bells, the Fed has finally said this week that inflation might be a concern in the short to medium term. Admitting you have a problem is the first step to solving it, I suppose. But the economy has become so used to easy money and the remaining steps to kick back this addiction are going to be a lot more painful. We are also used to seeing the memes about money printing and the headlines about stock shortages causing price spikes. But is it possible to actually fix this? Well, regular viewers of the channel will know I hate needlessly dragging out an answer, so yes. The Fed could fix this problem tomorrow if they really wanted to. But that type of extreme cure might be very well worse than the disease itself, which is the crux of the predicament we find ourselves in. A lot of people are frustrated that price inflation is happening before our eyes, and the people with the power to fix this problem don't even want to admit that it exists. You know, I'll, I'll just sum up and say, we understand our job, we will do our job. If, if we see inflation moving materially above 2% in a persistent way that risks inflation expectations drifting up, then we will use our tools to guide inflation and expectations back down to 2%. No one should doubt that we will do that. It just doesn't seem to make sense, but there is a really good reason why they are acting like this. To find out why, it's time to learn how money works to really understand how the Fed is stuck between a rock and a hard place right now. The reality is that they will eventually need to sacrifice one of the following things. The stock market, the housing market, the government, or the dollar itself. Imagine for a second that you suddenly become the chairman of the Fed. Lucky you. The first thing that you will need to know is what the Fed does is not quite as simple as people would have you believe. Sure, the Fed's main function is deciding if interest rates go up or if interest rates go down, which sounds easy enough, but they don't do this by just pulling a lever and letting it be so. No, they do this through a number of tools at their disposal, which will in turn influence interest rates in the broader economy. There is also something else to understand about this, which is that just because you say interest rates should go up or down doesn't always mean they will. Regular banks, businesses, and even the government can offer interest rates that are higher or indeed lower than the bank rate that you broadcast to the public. But the bank rate is still important, especially to regular banks, and it's the first tool you have to fight off the threat of inflation. The discount or bank rate is best thought of as the interest rate that the Reserve Bank charges to regular banks. If they want to borrow money from the Federal Reserve, they pay the bank rate. If regular banks want to deposit money with the Fed, they get paid the bank rate. It's exactly the same as either taking a loan from a regular bank or keeping some of your money in a high interest savings account. If the Fed raises the bank rate, it will simultaneously make it more expensive for regular banks to access cash, which will make it more expensive for you to get cash. The result of this is that less people are able to borrow money, which means less money floating around the economy, which lowers inflation. It really is elegantly simple, but this is the foundation of monetary policy, and it's why you have likely seen a lot of people talking about rising interest rates as an inevitable in the immediate future. The problem is that, as anybody with debt will tell you, this strategy has some serious side effects. Making debt more expensive means that buying anything will be a lot harder. If you want to buy a new car, your monthly payments will be higher, hurting automakers and dealers. If businesses want to invest in a new project by taking out a loan, higher interest rates might render it infeasible. And of course, then there is real estate. The real estate market is especially sensitive to changes in interest rates because almost all houses purchased in the United States are done so using a mortgage, which is an interest-bearing liability. If a 30-year fixed rate loan rises from 2.5% to 3.5%, it would mean someone who was previously able to pay off a $500,000 loan will only be able to pay off a $400,000 loan. That means this person will need to offer $100,000 less to purchase a given property in the area. If all potential buyers are in the same predicament, then a 1% change in an interest rate can cause a 20% drop in house prices. The Fed knows this, and the Fed also knows that the residential building industry is one of the largest employers in the nation, and that house prices are a major driver of consumer confidence. A disruption like this piled on top of a shaky rental moratorium and a severe shortage of building supplies could send devastating shockwaves through the entire economy. Many of you might think that property prices might deserve to take a hit after appreciating over 20% in some areas in the last year, and trust me, as a renter in San Francisco myself, I am right there with you. But a majority of the population are homeowners. A real estate crash doesn't just mean cheap houses for those of us priced out of the property market. It means widespread devastation for the entire economy. But all right, 
If this won't work, let's take a look at other tools you have to play with as make-believe Fed chairman. The next big tool you might want to utilize is the Fed's open market operations. The Federal Reserve is a very special institution because it can create money out of nothing and it can in turn use that money to buy up financial assets. The Fed can turn to regular banks and offer to buy up assets that they have on their books in exchange for cash. Normally, it will do this with very low-risk assets like government treasury bills and municipal bonds, but it can choose to do this with anything it wants. From the outset of the pandemic, the Fed has been buying up both government bonds as well as a selection of corporate bonds off of institutional banks in the US. These purchases put newly created money into the hands of the banks, which will hopefully then go out and loan more money to the government and businesses as they need it, which they normally will because they can just go and sell it at a markup to the Fed again for even more newly created cash. The Fed's balance sheet has doubled in the past two years to over $8 trillion in these types of assets on their books. The process of creating cash to buy up debt from financial institutions is called quantitative easing, a term I am sure you are all familiar with by this point in 2021. What you might not be familiar with is the reverse of this process, which is quantitative tightening. Quantitative tightening involves the Fed selling off the assets that it bought up in exchange for the cash that they put out there in the first place. Now, just as the Fed creates money out of thin air to buy up these assets, once the Fed sells them again, it just deleted the money from existence. Less money in circulation, less aggregate demand, less inflation, all while giving regular investors access to the assets they have been hoarding. Problem solved, right? Wrong. Sure, it will fix the inflation problem, but it will absolutely fuck over businesses and the government. If $8 trillion worth of corporate bonds and T-bills hit the market tomorrow, it would tank the price of these assets, supply and demand. This price drop would also make it extremely hard for businesses and the government to raise money in the open market. If the federal government needs money, it will call up the treasury to issue bonds to raise that money. But if the market for government bonds is totally flooded by the Fed dumping their position, then they are going to need to offer higher interest rates to potential investors in order for them to buy the new government bonds as opposed to the bonds being sold off by the Fed. Increasing the borrowing costs of the government and businesses right now would be bad news. We are already experiencing supply constraints in almost everything and making it more difficult for businesses to get a loan to stay afloat may in turn cause more inflation. If businesses go under, they will no longer be providing goods and or services to the economy. That means less supply, decreased supply in the price increases, and a general increase in prices is the literal definition of inflation. A fix to inflation that just causes more inflation is not exactly a great deal. So then what gives? How do we actually avoid this catastrophe? Well, we treat it like an angry bear and back away slowly. This global crisis hit the American economy while the Fed was actually still in the process of selling off its assets from the quantitative easing it did after the 2008 global financial crisis. The assets purchased within the last few months are probably going to take decades to unwind if they ever get sold at all. The Fed stepped out of its usual comfort zone for this one and bought up really crappy business bonds that were way less secure than the ultra prime stuff it normally likes to deal with. The same is true for interest rates. Jacking up interest rates is going to do more harm than good, which means that sustained inflation is just the least terrible choice that you can make as our imaginary chairman of the Fed. But if the Reserve Bank has effectively resigned itself to accepting above average inflation, why was it insisting up until recently that this wasn't an issue? Well, that all has to do with the final tool you have up your sleeve as our imaginary chairman of the Fed, public relations. The fear of inflation can cause inflation. If people think that inflation is coming, they will look to get rid of cash as soon as they receive it. I would imagine that most of you watching have thought to yourself at some point in recent months, ah, what the heck, I may as well buy this thing because I don't want to be holding on to too much cash right now anyway. Well, congratulations, you are part of the problem. If Jerome Powell gets on TV and says, inflation is coming, everybody save yourselves, that is going to do nothing but accelerate this self-fulfilling prophecy. It would be like a paramedic trying to stop a patient from going into shock by screaming, oh this is real bad, you probably are going to die. It might be the truth, it might be what you are secretly thinking, but that's not helping anybody right now. The good news amongst all of this is that we probably aren't in that much trouble yet. Assuming that things open back up and that businesses can get back to something resembling normal within the next few months, it's unlikely that we are going to have a huge problem with inflation, 
at least in the consumer market. Asset markets, well, that's a different story. We might just have to accept that inflation targets will be raised from 2% to 3% over the next few years. It's not ideal, but it's not going to be Zimbabwe. Now, something you might be thinking about is all of the money that the Fed is going to be making off its $8 trillion asset portfolio. So, is the Fed actually profitable? Fortunately, you can find out by watching my other video on how the Federal Reserve actually works under the hood. And thanks for learning how money works.